Good morning. If I could have your attention, we'll try to get started. Uh, good morning. I'm Keith Nectarline. I'm pleased to be able to in introduce Michael Green. Um, Michael Green is a distinguished professor here in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, of his many other titles, the one most relevant to t today's talk is that he's uh, director of the program at the VA for enhancing community integration for homeless veterans. Um, you know, we oftentimes don't recognize in our own midst are um, the international stars of, a, of an area, and Michael is one of those people. Um, we oftentimes take them for granted. Um, but Michael has um, published more than 400 journal articles. He's had numerous grants from NIMH and the VA. I'm just going to summarize a few of the awards because I don't want to take up too much of his time. But he's had awards from SIRS, the Schizophrenia International Research Society, which is now the premier international research society for outstanding clinical community science uh, uh, research. He's um, on the list of highly cited individuals, those in the top 1% of all citations in psychiatry psychology. He's won the Lieber Award from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, which is their highest uh, lifetime achievement award. Um, and he doesn't just do research. He also has won awards for his postdoc mentoring, uh, the campus-wide UCLA Award, an award from the Society for Research in Psychopathology, one that many of us value in this field. He won the Mentoring Award. And last year, many of you might have heard his um, university uh, faculty research lecture, um, a lecture only uh, given to the, the most outstanding speakers and scholars. Um, Michael's research started in schizophrenia, and it, um, especially cognition in schizophrenia, um, its uh, implications for everyday functioning, its neural basis, and its genetic underpinnings. Um, he moved from cognition in general to social cognition, including studies of emotion, so-called theory of mind perspective taking, um, and managing emotions. And then another um, more recent move forward, expansion of his interest, has been uh, what he's going to talk about today, the uh, focus on social isolation, uh, loneliness, and their uh, neural underpinnings. Um, I found in reviewing his slide that he not only will show us distinctions amongst these um, concepts, some of which I think you wouldn't um, intuitively uh, know, but he's also going to review for us some of the favorite lines from uh, recent popular music. Um, so uh, watch for that. Michael. So uh, Keith, thank you very much for that generous introduction. It's especially um, a pleasure for me to be introduced by Keith because uh, Keith was my postdoctoral mentor. Um, so the, uh, these are the disclosures. Um, and as uh, Keith mentioned, our uh, research team is primarily uh, uh, grounded in schizophrenia research. That's what we've been doing for a long time. Uh, and that's how we got interested in the issue of social uh, connection and social disconnection, and that's what has uh, taken us away from schizophrenia into the general uh, community. In the, uh, the, the talk is going to be in two parts. The first part I'll be giving uh, an overview about what's happening internationally, um, uh, why is the public health concern, I'll make this distinction between disconnection and loneliness. The second part of the talk, though, is where we take methods that we worked out in the study of schizophrenia, trying to apply it to understand social disconnection in the general community. I'll make this distinction between ability and motivation, and at the end I'll uh, spend a couple minutes to circle back to the discussion of schizophrenia. Um, so uh, the, 
Um, the starting here, so let's look internationally around this, and I have only one correction to Keith's um, generous introduction, which is that these are not recent songs. The uh, first part of this talk will be uh, undergirded by quotes from classic rock, actually. So uh, the, the first is there's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear, and that's Buffalo Springfield. Um, so let's take a look at the European Union. The European Union has conducted extensive surveys about social isolation, social disconnection. I'll be defining these terms as we go. And the results were striking and still are. 7% of Europeans say they never meet friends or relatives, not even once a year. That is an extreme form of social disconnection. In a similar vein, can you ask anybody for help, a relative, a friend, a neighbor? 7% say no. So this is really a, a relatively high percentage of the European Union that would be, by any definition, uh, socially disconnected. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute, I know Europe. Europe's not all the same. There's the cold Nordic countries. There's the warm social Mediterranean countries. Certainly those countries are very different in how socially connected people are. So I did a deeper dive anticipating that you were thinking exactly that. So I can assure you that on the one hand, yes, there is considerable variability uh, in how connected countries are. So let's take a look and see if there's any regional differences. The most connected include, son of a gun, Nordic countries, Denmark and Sweden, as well as Mediterranean countries, Spain and Greece. The least connected countries include Italy, uh, as well as countries from uh, other parts of Europe. This is so not geographically sensible that Slovakia is one of the most connected and Czech Republic is one of the least connected and they used to be the same country. So there is variability, but how, what accounts for it is something that's not obvious from just the geographic location. Now, let's take the hikikomori of Japan, hiding in my room, safe within my womb. I touch no one, and no one touches me. That's Paul Simon. The hikikomori is a special situation in Japan. It's a condition in which individuals isolate themselves for a period of at least six months, um, and that these tend to be young men staying at home. That becomes relevant in a minute. Um, the definition of it is a um, problem that's established by the late 20s, cooping oneself up in one's home and not participating or for a minimum six months. But this is the key part, does not seem to have another psychological problem as its principal source. This is the uh, definition from the person who coined the term, the hikikomori. Um, Estimates are really soft on this, maybe about 1% uh, in Japan. But what's interesting, um, if you've been following this, is that it was proposed as a syndrome for DSM-5. It didn't get in. Also proposed as a C syndrome for ICD-11. At this point, it doesn't look like it's getting in. But, you, but there is this phenomenon of young people, often men, who are just staying at home. Now, is the hikikomori limited to Japan? No. Spain, India, Korea, Brazil, Oman, Ukraine, they all are presenting cases of hikikomori. So it's not limited. On the other hand, these studies from around the world are typically looking at people who are seeking help. They're coming through clinics. So, and that's a big distinction. These are coming through clinics, and then they're identified as having the social isolation associated with it. So our interest is going to be, as you'll see in a minute, what's happening for people who are not coming to your clinics? What's happening in the community in terms of social disconnection? All right, I'm pleased to announce the world has its first Minister of Loneliness. Last year, the UK named the first ever such position, um, all the lonely people, where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where do they all belong? That's the Beatles, of course. Um, and it's estimated that about 9 million people in a population of 66 million often or always feel lonely. This was one of the sort of justifications for the appointment of this uh, minister for this ministry. And it's estimated that about 200,000 older people in the UK have not had a conversation with a friend or relative in a month. 
The purpose of this ministry is still a little unclear to me. It seems to be that its role is to assess the implications of other policy decisions on loneliness and isolation in the UK. But at least it's made it to the um, sort of official governmental levels. What about the US? I want to live alone in the desert. I want to live like Georgia O'Keeffe. I want to live on the Upper East Side and never go down in the street. Splendid Isolation by Warren Zevon also gives me the title of this talk. In the United States, we have a warning from a Surgeon General. This is the former Surgeon General Murthy, who was asked what the biggest disease in America was, said, it's not cancer, it's not heart disease, it's isolation. It's the pronounced isolation that so many people are experiencing that is the great pathology of our lives today. This is a Surgeon General's warning. Uh, and the isolation here, I know from other parts of his interviews, include both subjective and objective isolation. And that's the difference between loneliness and social disconnection, which we're going to talk about shortly. So round and round and round we go. Where the world's headed, nobody knows. It's just a ball of confusion. There is a huge amount of ambiguity as we consider these international trends. First of all, whose problem is it? Like, which is the field that's best able to understand what's going on? So far, most of the work has been in sociology and epidemiology, but economics plays into it. That's actually why Japan started studying this problem. They didn't understand why young men who could be entering the workforce were staying at home. Mental illness, social and affective neuroscience, those are things this department does, it's things that our team does, and the question is whether we have something to say about these trends of increased disconnection that are occurring. The other big problem is the terminology, which is that there's a conflation between objective isolation, which we'll refer to consistently as social disconnection, and subjective isolation, which we'll refer to consistently as loneliness. Those are two different things, and they're not all that closely related so let's then look at the definition of social disconnection. It's easier to be disconnected than connected. I got a huge hallelujah for all the people who are connected. I can't do that. That's Bob Dylan. Now, social disconnection refers to a longstanding lack of family or social relationships, limited participation in things like community activities. Um, it's prevalent among individuals with severe mental illness. As I mentioned, the interest in schizophrenia is what got us started in this. But it's also frequent in the general community. And it constitutes a public health problem. What do I mean by a public health problem? Well, take this into account. Look at what accounts for early mortality. These are hazard ratios. And so you've got everything that you've thought about that would be associated with early mortality. Poverty, obesity, hypertension, smoking, poor health. But put social disconnection on your list of things. The risk associated with this, this is for a 14-year follow-up, the risk associated with social disconnection is on a par with smoking and poor health and poverty. And it's greater than obesity. So this is something that has direct consequences. Um, now, in contrast, we got loneliness. Loneliness is the subjective evaluation of social interactions. Um, it's less associated than I would have guessed uh, when starting in this area. If you just take a general population, the correlation between loneliness and, and disconnection is only about 0.25. Loneliness, not surprisingly, is associated with depression. It's, it's a dysphoria. It's a discomfort with this kind of a uh, 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 being uh, the quality of social relationships. They show different patterns across age. Loneliness tends to decrease with age until quite late. Um, and uh, social connection doesn't follow that pattern. Um, the uh, disconnection also predicts the, the loneliness and disconnection predict, predict opposite directions of Medicare spending for some reason that people don't quite understand. The point is that they're not quite the same thing. But on the other hand, it doesn't make sense to view them as entirely disconnected either. I mean, the numbers say they're not all that connected, but 
you can just think of examples. If you lose a partner or a spouse, that's going to increase disconnection and loneliness both. Um, remaining in the same home decreases both disconnection and loneliness. Uh, chronically lonely people are less likely to be socially connected. So you can think of examples in which there should be some connection, but it's unclear when these things are connected and when they're not. And if you just look at them across a large population, you'll find they're not all that highly connected. Now, are they both associated with early mortality? The answer is clearly yes. They're both associated with early mortality, and the rates are almost identical. So you'll see here studies that looked at social disconnection, studies that looked at loneliness. They are not the same studies. People are not looking at the same thing, in, uh, at both of these things in the same study. There are the loneliness studies. There are the disconnection studies. They show almost exactly the same rates of early mortality. You'll notice these are a little bit lower than what I showed you previously for disconnection. There's a reason. These control for baseline health. So you'd expect some attenuation of those um, ratios if you control for um, baseline health. And this is what you're seeing here. This is a meta-analysis across a large number of studies. And the follow-up here was on average seven years. You always have to talk about sort of the length of follow-up when you're talking about these kinds of mortality indices. So. What we wanted to do was try to understand social disconnection in the general community, and we wanted to apply methods that we had uh, developed uh, or borrowed or stolen for the study of schizophrenia. And we wanted to separate ability from motivation. This is going to be a recurring theme in, in almost everything that we're doing these days, and to take loneliness into account if we need to. The study is just getting off the ground. There's a large number of elements. I'll talk about performance-based and EEG and interview based measures today. We also have fMRI that's being collected. We have two clinical samples, uh, bipolar samples, schizophrenia. We have cytokines. So there's a lot of things that are going to come into play. But right now, I'll just give you the sort of early look at how this study's going. So let me define a few terms. First of all, what's the general community? Um, <clears throat> We don't have a great definition. The point is we wanted to get away from using referrals or psychiatric clinics and see what's going to happen if we get out of people who are seeking help themselves. Um, how much social disconnection is there in the general community? Who knows? Uh, if you just say how many people do not have anyone to confide in, it's about 5 to 10% of the American sample. Uh, so that's, that's consistent with what we see in those uh, European data that I showed you earlier. Is social disconnection increasing in the US? Who knows? Probably it is. There are certain trends that do seem to be occurring with reliability across different surveys. One is that the size of social networks is decreasing over time. The other is that single occupancy households is increasing over time. So in general, there's a feeling that social disconnection is uh, increasing. And here's the question that most people have is, well, what, what effect has online social networking had? Does it help? Does it hurt? The answer is it does both. Um, there isn't a clear direction. It really depends on what the social networking is used for. It can be used as a avenue towards increased social interactions, or it can be used as a way to avoid such uh, interactions. So the question is now, if we want to do a study like this, how do we go about doing it? Um, like, how do we find a sample with social disconnection if we don't want to go through clinics? And we said, we'll place an ad on the internet, meaning that we'll get people who look at ads on the internet. I understand that already restricts exactly, I, so you, you don't have to point it out to me. I already know that's the limit. <laughs> okay. so, um, so I, I know that means that we get those people who look at the internet. Um, and so the ad was, do you have few friends, little contact with family members, and typically do activities alone? And we get phone calls. Um, so when we bring these individuals in, we can assess them on a, a battery of social connection measures. We have a, a, a nice uh, developed composite score that looks across a number of these measures. And so you can see in the top, this is I'll present data on 105 individuals, the, the, the uh, blue distribution is people who self-identified as being disconnected. And you can see they're not all uh, uh, on the uh, left-hand side, but they're shifted to the left. They're shifted towards disconnection. 
The red group is our unselected group of normal controls, just like we recruit for any other study. They are uh, shifted toward the right, being more connected. So we have clear two distributions. We're not analyzing the data based on what they said about themselves. Instead, what we do is we put the two uh, distributions together, which gives us a nice broad sample. And then uh, Jonathan Wynn, who's here, uh, uh, examined this for different uh, identifiable subgroups using a cluster analytic approach. And then we can get three groups, the groups that are in low, medium, and high in terms of the amount of disconnection that they have. And so when we do that, you see here um, the sample sizes. You see the age. They're in their 40s. And you see the three groups, low, medium, and high. Um, this tends to be a, a little more male than female. Um, the group from the most part is working full part, uh, full time or part time. They're not, they're not uh, completely given up on work at all. You do see some difference in marital status in a way that you'd predict, which is that very few of the low um, connection group is, is married. So this gives you some sense. Now, the question you should be asking is, that's fine, but these all come through ads. Is the disconnected group really disconnected? So the answer to that is they are more disconnected than our sample of chronic schizophrenia, OK? So the range in these samples is pretty good by the kind of standards we would use. Now, what kind of individuals did we get? This is TL. She's a 49-year-old single female. And at the time of interview, she was living alone in an apartment, employed sporadically as a TV extra, and intermittently collecting unemployment disability. She completed college with a degree in French language and culture. She reported she loves being an actress and feels like dressing up and playing all day. It's her way of participating in society. She spent her time exercising, watching cooking and travel shows, baking and running errands. When asked why she responded to the study ad, she stated, I have few friends and prefer to be alone. Further, she reported she had never been in a close romantic relationship, but she would like a significant other. On measures of social disconnection, she endorsed low levels of approach motivation, moderate levels of loneliness. She endorsed some personality disorder traits, including preferring to do things alone because it makes her more efficient, and expressing ambivalence about physical intimacy. But she did not meet criteria uh, for a personality disorder. So we have our sample of about 100 people. We have it <clears throat> across these three groups. And so there are certain questions that immediately come to mind, which is that, is this a temporary disruption, or is this a stable characteristic of the sample? And so if we look at the entire sample, remember they're in their 40s. They say that they've been this way in terms of connection to family, connection to friends, on average about you know, you know, 16 years for friends and 24 years for family. This is long standing. This is not, I went away to college and didn't have friends kind of situation. I moved to a new city and felt this. This is, uh, this is how I typically am in my adult life. But the real question is, is that true also for that low cluster, the gl group that's in low connection? The answer is yes. The years are uh, roughly the same. These are fairly, not extremely, but fairly long-standing characteristics of the sample, not a temporary disruption. Next question. Did we get autism spectrum? For the most part, no. We only had two people in autism spectrum uh, based on a, a standard scale of that. Did we have loneliness in our sample that associated with connection? The answer is yes. So here we're a little surprised because we were looking at the, you know, the survey data and we thought maybe there's not much of a connection. But in our sample, there is a significant group difference with the disconnected group being more lonely. So we're going to have to take that into account uh, in some of our analyses. Um, now, online social connection, this is, again, uh, where we say, well, on the one hand, maybe the people that aren't connected are spending all their time on electronic media for social connection. And the answer is no, that's clearly not happening. The online social connection mirrored the in-person social connection. Those people that are more connected in person were more connected online. So there's not a compensation or anything like that going. So let's get to um, the, this one other issue, which is that, and this is an interesting point, and it's come up ever since we started working in this area, where somebody who understands interaction says something like, yeah, but maybe the disconnected people kind of send signals that lead people to pull away from them. So we looked at things like odd 
and eccentric speech. We get that as part of our interviews. And the answer is, we don't get a lot of it. Um, here you can see odd behavior, odd speech. Uh, nobody has both. Um, we do see it in the medium and low group, so that part's intuitive, but it's not a lot. So maybe there's a few of these uh, individuals in which this is occurring, but it's not characterizing uh, these samples uh, generally. So let's go now to the uh, performance data. Um, so we're going to look at um, social processing ability first, which is can these individuals process, understand social information in their environment? In other words, is there an association with degree of connection and how effectively people can handle things like social cue perception, mentalizing, or empathy? So is there, does that track with how connected someone is? Makes perfect sense that it would. If you can't process the cues, maybe you wouldn't be that interactive. But that's different from motivation, which is do they want to socially engage with their environment? And there's two different types of motivation. Bill Haran's done a lot of work in this area, which is that there's this, this quality of indifference, which is, a, you know, do you have a lot of motivation to approach or low motivation to approach? And there's a kind of discomfort factor, which is do you have a motivation to avoid? And I know some of you say that I make everything more complicated than it needs to be. The fact is these are not two sides of the same coin. These are two different neural systems, two different processes entirely. So you have to look at them in, uh, separately. So let's go ahead and look at the performance-based measures. I'll give you uh, examples of how we measure these three things. Then I'll show you the data all in one slide. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you can sort of compare them. The uh, social cue perception is basically how we identify cues um, in voices, body movements, gestures, gait. Um, and it's most commonly studied in facial affect perception. There's a number of standardized measures. We use a uh, facial affect perception test from uh, Ekman's Library of Faces. There's a number of them. They're all pretty reliable. They're all easy to administer. Um, and the uh, key neural structures we know from a lot of fMRI work involves the fusiform gyrus and the amygdala. If you get to other forms of cue perception, the superior temporal sulcus is also extremely important in the inferior frontal gyrus. That's one <clears throat> domain. The second domain is mentalizing, which you might know by its other names, theory of mind or mental state attribution. And that's how you make, inf you go beyond the cues to make inferences about what someone's thinking, what they're feeling, what they're thinking about you. <clears throat> and um, it's how you take other people's perspective. It's also uh, perspective taking. We have a measure we've used for a while um, called the tacit, which involves videotapes followed by brief yes and no questions, that this test <clears throat> tends to um, uh, assess sarcasm and white lies. Because can you detect sarcasm? Can you detect white lies? In this example, <clears throat> um, the context is Michael has just smashed the boss's car. Ruth, who's a coworker, says to Michael, the boss is going to love to hear about this. I bet I'll give you a promotion. Um, and the question is, can you detect <clears throat> in the video from context, intonation, eye rolling, whatever, what the intended message is. And then there's a series of yes or no questions. Is, he, is Ruth trying to make Michael worry less? She's trying to say it's not as bad. And so th these are ways that we can detect uh, mentalizing. Now, mentalizing has a well-established network, uh, including the temporal parietal junction, temporal pole, uh, precuneus and medial prefrontal uh, cortex. We see this very reliably in our fMRI studies. So how do we, me so now if we want to put the, this together, so we have social cue perception, we have mentalizing, we want to put things together in a way that integrates things, we come up with things like empathy. And we can measure empathy with empathic accuracy, which is a indication of how well you can monitor moment by moment changes in the mood of someone you're talking to. Can you track moment by moment changes in how someone you're talking to is feeling? Um, <clears throat> this was, uh, 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 Jung Hee Lee uh, took the lead in developing this, this task for us. This is how it works. You put up an ad and you get subjects to come into the lab and they write down good and bad experiences from their life. They just make a list of good experiences, bad experiences. They talk, they talk for two minutes on each of those <clears throat> alone in a room 
in front of a camera, they, they're talking about these autobiographical events. Um, and the point is that if you're going to ask people to sign a release so that we can do anything with these films, to sit in a room alone, talk to a camera about themselves, LA's the place to be. And you can get a, a, a large response of people that are quite happy to come in and do this. Okay. <clears throat> so then what happens is that after they've done this, we convert the files and <clears throat> they watch themselves talking about the events they just talked about. And they rate themselves on how they were feeling. Because with empathy, the question is, where do you get a gold standard, right? Where's the right answer? The right answer is what you say about yourself when you're watching yourself. That becomes the right answer, or as close to a right answer as we have in this business. So what happens then is they rate themselves moving the cursor up and down. I was feeling a little better here, a little worse there, a little worse there, better there. And you get this time series. And then you bring in a subject, and the subject does exactly the same thing, which is that the subject watches the, the unfortunate term for the first person is the target. They watch the film uh, that the target made, and they also do their ratings. I think she's feeling a little better here. I think she's feeling a little worse here. A little better, a little better. And the subject moves the cursor up and down. Then what you have is you have these two time series, and you get a correlation. And the correlation tells you how accurately the subject was able to monitor the mood of the target. And then uh, Zhang He has assembled a library of these tapes. We now have it as a standardized test. And so this gives us an indication of empathic accuracy. So now let me show you some data. So we have measures of social cue perception, measures of mentalizing, measures of empathic accuracy. How did that differ across our three groups? Social cue perception, facial affect recognition, no difference. All right, let's look at mentalizing. No difference. Those are standard error bars, by the way. Um, what about empathic accuracy? No difference. No difference. This is the most impressive non-finding I've ever found. <laughs> okay. There is like nothing happening here. And this really puts us in a very different place than we are with schizophrenia, where we find these connections to social uh, uh, disconnection. So now, uh, more recently, um, we thought we're working up our EEG data, and this is where Jonathan Wynn has taken the lead. And so we have a paradigm to look at an event-related potential. It's called the N170, in which there's three different judgments that are made. One is to identify emotion in faces. One is to identify gender in faces. And one is to identify something that has nothing to do with faces in our paradigm. It's the number of stories in a building, one or two. And looking at this, you can get a, a there's a, Pro, there's a prototypic wave, the N170, which is associated with face processing. And it can be face processing for gender or emotion, but it would be different than the comparison condition, which would be the buildings. So the question is, do we find then the same kind of story when we look at the neural level? The answer here is yes. We also find no differences. You can see the three groups, and you can see the two different judgments, uh, emotion and gender. And we simply have no differences. So no matter how we look at ability with performance or so far with EEG. And again, we're just working up the EEG data. We're not seeing a lot of indications, which then brings us to motivation. So the question now with motivation is, um, yeah, what about the two different types? There's the uh, uh, approach motivation, or uh, what we'll look at as indifference, which if you um, is sort of establishing a sense of safety, it has particular brain regions. These are reward processing regions, uh, partly um, associated with dopamine and oxytocin. Um, the, uh, the motivation to avoid uh, is a threat sensitive system. Um, different brain regions, amygdala, insula would be the sort of uh, classic areas, and cortisol and serotonin would be more associated with this system. So again, two different neural systems and two different types of um, uh, factors. We know that there's uh, two different factors because we gave a number of scales which were all related to social motivation. Uh, there were five different scales, ten different subscales. We factor analyzed it and found that there, in fact, was a social indifference factor.
low on social approach, and a social discomfort factor, high on social avoidance. So we can look at these two factors separately in our sample. So the question is, although we found nothing with ability, do we find differences in motivation in these two groups? And the answer is very clearly yes. So here's the social indifference factor, which is a higher score means more indifference. Um, with each of these, I sort of have to give you the direction because it's not always intuitive. Higher means more indifference. The low group is more indifferent. The high group is not. This is a significant difference. So now that we have a significant difference, we say, gee, is this significant even after we control for loneliness? The answer is yes that this, particularly this indifference factor, is associated with um, degree of social connection, and it is independently associated with degree of social connection. What about the discomfort factor, where the higher score is more discomfort? Big difference, the, looks very similar. There's a more discomfort in the low group, um, and less discomfort in the high group, the medium group's in the middle. This, however, does become non-significant after we control for loneliness. So there is a motivation a relationship here with avoidance, but it's not independent of loneliness. And we're just beginning to work out um, uh, the EEG data on this. We don't have a great measure of motivation uh, with EEG, but we have a measure, which is EEG frontal asymmetry. This is um, an alpha asymmetry measure, which is kind of a non-specific measure of uh, approach and avoidance, not limited to social processing at all, but it's, it's what we've got. And um, the, these data, which Jonathan just worked up, show something roughly in the right area. So that um, the asymmetry, that's the F asymmetry or the activity asymmetry uh, with the EEG, is in the right direction. The low group has more of this, uh, is in the direction of more avoidant motivation, whereas the other groups are less. However, the only significant difference we have so far is between the middle group and the low group. So it's a sort of, it's in the right direction. It's still early with our EEG data, but at least it's partially consistent with the notion that something is going on with motivation and that, uh, and that looking at these two motivation factors separately are informative. The alpha asymmetry doesn't give us a good way to tease them apart, but at least it's consistent with what we're seeing with the other measures. So let me go through the conclusions and then circle back to schizophrenia and then open it up for questions. Is it feasible to recruit a sample that has a broad range of social connection? The answer is yes. It's a broad range, we can get them, and our disconnected group is very disconnected because we have a uh, comparison in our chronic schizophrenia for that. Is the pattern of disconnection stable over time? Relatively stable. I mean, I, I think this is kind of what you'd expect for a group this age, uh, if it's something that characterizes most of adulthood. Um, so it's not, it's not temporary disruptions. Um, is it associated with autism spectrum? Clearly no. Odd or eccentric behavior? Not really. I mean, not to any large extent. Uh, loneliness? Yes. We did find an association there. So this is what we found so far in terms of the sample itself. Is it associated with ability, social processing ability? No for social cue perception, no for analyzing, no for empathic accuracy, no for EEG measures of social cue perception. This is a very consistent non-finding. Now, is it associated with social motivation? Yes, for um, greater social indifference, and that's true even after controlling for loneliness. Yes, for social discomfort, but not independent of loneliness. And I'm giving it a partial yes for the EEG data, which we're just working up now. So big difference between ability and uh, motivation. And as someone who has spent their career looking at schizophrenia, we really didn't expect to see this kind of a separation between ability and motivation because it doesn't look that way in schizophrenia. So let's go back to schizophrenia then. Um, now that we have left psychosis research, is there anything that's, that we've learned here in looking at the general community that we can go back to schizophrenia research and say, gee, this might be relevant. 
And if I were to say some of the developments in schizophrenia research that might be relevant, one is the focus on negative symptoms. There's been um, a, a number of studies with drugs with novel mechanisms that have shown basically some encouraging findings. Um, not all of them have, have panned out, but there's enough encouragement there of, of drugs that affect negative symptoms. But there's also psychosocial interventions that might be relevant for uh, motivation that are being tried out in schizophrenia. I'm going to mention uh, a study that uh, Felice Reddy from our lab is doing where she's combining motivational interviewing with cognitive behavioral therapy to focus specifically on negative symptoms and motivational negative symptoms. Um, this study is ongoing. It's a fairly large study. But even with the, re uh, this, the results are already significant with an N of 63 on motivational negative symptoms. Uh, the, the, this combined treatment is better than a comparison control treatment. Um, and so we're seeing now a psychosocial effect on negative symptoms. So in the schizophrenia, there is some energy in the treatment of negative symptoms, both in the psychopharm area and in the psychosocial area. But, but, uh, I, uh, Felice's study is an exception. Most studies combine different types of negative symptoms. So you've got your expressive symptoms and your motivational symptoms all sort of clumped together. Um, that means that we haven't really teased out motivational factors directly. Also, there's nothing in the schizophrenia literature that's specific to social motivation versus motivation more generally. So this is a useful area to be in, but it's not, it, it isn't tied directly in. Um, now, the context here, which I've tried to make clear, is that We've taken social neuroscientific measures that we used in schizophrenia and now have been using them to examine social processing in the general community. But this is not what we see in schizophrenia. We see very clear ability deficits, and those deficits are associated with social functioning in schizophrenia. We're just not seeing it in the general community. So this is a distinct pattern. Um, now, the problem is that we've spent most of our energy and intervention focusing on ability. That's not a problem for schizophrenia. That's where the need is. But it means that we are more skilled in addressing ability problems based on what we've done in schizophrenia. That doesn't mean we're wrong to do it. It just means that it's not as easy to apply to this population. So we have, for example, the social cognitive skills training that Bill Haran took the lead in developing in our lab to enhance social cue perception and mentalizing. We have uh, several studies with oxytocin, starting with uh, Mike Davis, who's now at the FDA, Steve Martyr, and we're, we're looking at ability. Um, the interesting thing about oxytocin is that it does a couple different things. So for example, it involves social salience, which has been our interest. We w we've been focusing on it for social salience as a way to enhance social processing ability. But it also enhances affiliative motivation. So there's no reason why it can't be used to address concerns about social motivation as well. It's just that we haven't done it. Um, so, but it does mean that there might be a psychopharm avenue to pursue in terms of enhancing motivation. But the, the, the message here is that if we want to take the range of things that we've done in psychosis and apply it to this question, we're going to have to refocus our energies to um, social motivation in understanding it better and in intervening better. And in my last slide, I want to point out the large number of people whose work were represented in this talk. Uh, Jonathan Wynn, Jung Hee Lee, Steve Martyr, uh, Felice Reddy, um, Bill Haran, Amanda McCleary, and others. This is the group I have the privilege of working with every day. This is the group that's doing the work, many of whom are here today. And so I want to thank them, and I want to thank you for your attention. So, I, it was an excellent talk, Michael. Um, just one comment and then we'll take questions. Um, I realize the golden age of rock and roll <laughs> lyrics was actually not recent, but it makes me feel so lonely. <laughs> so, permit me as a coping strategy to call it recent. So, serious questions. Okay, my question. One of my questions is, did you do historical interviews to look at them from their childhood? No. So we can begin, okay, because no. I'm curious about, you know, what's biologically, neurologically, yeah. kind of a fa 
affecting this versus what's historically otherwise? Because it seems like given how many people you saw and the results that you got, that it's important to look at what are um, neurological issues yeah. that may be affecting that motivational stuff. Yeah, so the answer is we did not do a good job of that. We certainly got lifetime psychiatric histories as part of our standard interviews. But if you're asking, did we go into things like childhood adversity and this, we, we right. actually didn't. And, and in retrospect, if, if we were starting the study now, we would. Did you look to see whether uh, adverse events like uh, breakup with a boyfriend or girlfriend, yeah. loss of a very important job, were at the root of some of the disconnection or loneliness? Yeah, so th we, did, we didn't do it directly is the answer. We did it indirectly by trying to get an estimate of how long uh, uh, individuals have been that way in terms of their interactions. And so we took some comfort in the fact that these were long-standing tendencies. And we figured if these were situational effects, we would have a lot of one and two year kinds of answers, and we just didn't. Thanks, Michael, for a great talk. Uh, I'm wondering about reward pathways uh -huh. when you're talking about social indifference. Is there any reason to believe that there's blunted reward pathways yes. in the socially indifferent? Yeah, I, the, the, absolutely. Uh, I think um, in the, in, in the uh, long list of things that we would do differently if we were starting today, uh, and actually in the studies that we're proposing now, um, and we've got um, uh, Peter uh, Clayson here and, and others, we are now much, much more interested in both EEG and fMRI indications of reward processing. And we weren't aware enough of the importance when we started the study. But clearly, with our new studies, we're, we're pushing in that direction relatively hard, both with scanning and with EEG. Yeah. And I think, oh, there's one back there and then one here. Hi, thank you for a great talk. I was really interested in the distinction between indifference and the uh, avoidant yeah. uh, social disconnection. Is there any way of looking at um, negative outcome or from those lifespan studies? Um, is there any way to, to discern uh, between the, the ones who are indifferent and the ones who are avoidant within the socially disconnected group and then associate that with negative lifespan outcome or health outcome? So, uh, 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 so this is a cross-sectional study. One of the things we did propose, though, is that uh, if we collected the sample, we'd be able to follow them up. Predictors of the sort of, um, not generally, but predictors of social connection change is something we're very interested in and really would like to do as a follow-up, but didn't have the sort of ability to propose that in the initial, even though the grant's ambitious, it's still a cross-sectional one, but we specifically said this was a follow-up topic we wanted to pursue. Did you have a question? Did you look in general at motivation to change, but also uh, um, so, um, so, uh, we didn't, uh, you know, in some ways, this comes very close to the motivational interviewing uh, approach as, as the intervention. We didn't have a generic uh, a question about that, though. Yeah, so we're, uh, again, sort of, uh, uh, there are now sc scales that we're using. In fact, we're using it uh, in Felisa's study and others that would give us some sense as to how specific this is. But we're clearly we're finding the connect. The, the um, assessment of the um, groups is based solely on social connections. So at least we know that part is strictly uh, social. The other scales, uh, they tend to be social, but they're not pure in that regard. So let me ask, um, as you moved from schizophrenia research to this, um, were you thinking that there would be social cognitive ability differences like there are in schizophrenia and not just motivational ones? M most definitely. We, we were um, surprised, to put it mildly, that they're just not there. Yeah. That, that was, um, 
that was our expectation, that was our hypothesis, that was our motivation going in, our, our interest going in. Um, so uh, this is, I mean, this is the one uh, good thing about leaving your area of comfort is that you can get dramatic surprises uh, when you go wander off into other territory. Yeah, that was, it, it's rather striking. Yeah. Um, so you weren't planning to just do a number of studies of social cognitive ability that come out negative. <laughs> so, if we can get them funded, we would do that. <laughs> uh, thanks, Michael, for a great talk. You started out the talk by talking about the morbidity and uh, mortality rates associated with loneliness and isolation. Yeah. And then I think you made a fairly convincing case, just to follow up on what Keith just said, that the folks you brought into the lab were surprisingly pretty intact in terms yeah. of and then there's some indication, if I followed it correctly, that perhaps they're not even that motivated and they kind of like being alone. There's something, and they may lack motivation, and then you had some biological parameters. So how do you reconcile those two things uh, in terms of a mechanism of action? Like usually you would think, well, people that are depressed, uh, they have some somatic uh, morbidity or something that's associated with the mortality. So if these are happy people who seem to be alone, uh, enjoy being alone and doing things by themselves, and they have the ability to do all this, but they're choosing not to, mm -hmm. what would be the mechanism of action for the health morbidity, do you yeah. think? Yeah, um, so uh, this is tying back into the, um, the early mortality. Um, and just to be clear, we're, we're looking across these three groups, so we're finding a clear distinction on indifference independent of loneliness, but we're also finding a difference in avoidance, which would have that kind of dys dysphoria associated with it. And not surprisingly, it becomes non-significant. Um, your question kind of assumes that it's the dysphoria that's leading to the early mortality. There's not an agreement on that. I mean, there's a number of, uh, there's a number of reasons why not being with other people might not be good for your uh, longevity. Um, and the discomfort is one of those, but um, just also just the sort of lack of uh, sort of positive health behaviors that are associated with being with other people. Your question, by the way, which is where I thought you were going initially, does raise a question as to whether or not the early mortality in schizophrenia is partly accounted for by the lack of social connections. And uh, what little data we have on that is consistent with that notion too. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to be unhappy with it. There's just something about being disconnected that's not good for one's longevity. Hi, Dr. Green, thank yeah. you. Uh, just wanted to ask, uh, did you look at whether the uh, socially amotivated group uh, had other um, lack of motivation to other stimuli, like non-social stimuli, or was it socially specific? Um, so we, um, th the closest we come is that frontal asymmetry, which is non-specific. Um, but the groups were defined based on social preferences that they have. So they're fully defined that way. Um, and the uh, scales themselves are heavily social. That was an answer to your question. They, the frontal asymmetry would be a good example of a nonspecific measure in which we are getting this tendency of a, the disconnected group to differ on that as well. Hello. Hi, Jess. Nice talk. Um, I was wondering if you've, um, so you talked about one way of creating the subgroups. I'm wondering if you've looked at all um, whether there's something different or if there are subgroups that have like high avoidance motivation, yeah. Yeah. but you know, you know what I'm saying. I do. Um, so the, uh, to both. Yeah. So our, our, our initial plan here, very consistent with how we wrote the grant, is to have a dimensional rating on level of social connectedness. But as soon as you start talking, and these are conversations we've had in our group too, uh, as soon as you start talking about two different dimensions of motivation, you start, you, you start wondering about, I wonder what a cluster analysis would look like and how many fall into different categories. That clearly is something that we'll do when we get our samples up a little bit higher. But we're, right now we're sticking pretty closely to the original plan of the grant, but you can imagine a number of fancy ways to look at, um, at sort of cl clusters, and that is a, a good logical one. 
Well, let's thank Michael for a superb talk.